Listener Production. G'day, it's Rusty here, all set for part three of my podcast with Australian drag racing legend Jim Reed. As I often say, if you've arrived here and not heard part one, jump back to the library and give it a listen. This is also one of those rare episodes which we've made a three-parter. So if you want to chronologically take it in, make sure you find time for part two as well. There's some fantastic yarns in there from a brush with death during COVID to a story only recently shared at his son Bruce's 60th, how a stern conversation with the police when he was a young father became the catalyst for Jim's lifelong passion for drag racing. Plus, a frightening crash at Willowbank that is etched like film in his mind, and he recalls that day in detail, and much, much more. We begin part two by talking about the future A new venture announced literally as we sat there involving Andy Lopez, who promotes the Summer Nats, and respected motorsport TV director and producer Nathan Prentergast, who is a recent addition to the Rusty's Garage Library. You can find that later. After a period being fractured and only showing glimpses of its former glory, this news is something of a new beginning for drag racing and has great potential in Australia. And it's already unified many areas of the sport and galvanised those who are the backbone of it. Are you excited about that new chapter, mate? I know that's happening pretty much, you know, as we talk probably. I it's going to get today announced. today or tomorrow. Yeah. It's yeah. today they're making yeah. the We're not releasing this for a little while, so it's okay. So, But, but I mean, it's getting announced, I think, today as you and yeah. I talk here. So, I mean, it's... it's Well, it needed to. It needed to, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Needed yeah. to unify things. Yep. Um, the biggest victory for them is turning Cowan around. Hmm. Have you ever read my book? I I am told I need to, so I haven't read it read it yet. I'll give you one before you please, go. Please, that'd be good. <clears throat> and you'll understand about the conflict with Cowan and I. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't gone there today. I didn't know if you wanted to go down that path, so I've let it be. I've just let it be. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. uh, a lot of years ago. Mm-hmm. And he got his nose out of joint about something he shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, he made allegations. It's all in the book. Okay. It's all there. Is he, it better now? Huh? Is it better between the pair of you now? I haven't spoken like? to him in, mm. since uh, 2010. Mm. But <clears throat> I've said to, the boys converted him around. Mm-hmm. That's where I was going in saying if you've got him converted, I had you spoken to him. So no, keep going. No, I haven't spoken to him. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm quite happy to move on. And it's a shame. It was jealousy. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. And everyone used to say, why do you bother with that guy? And I said, well, we've been friends since early 70s, early 60s. Mm. I said, he's never pissed on me. Mm. Well, he did mm. in 2010 mm. when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame in America. Mm-hmm. Now, the story was him and I were the best of mates. I used to go to the track every morning. I'd leave home at seven. Mm. He'd know I'd be driving up the Great Western Highway at 20 past. He'd call me, come for a coffee read. Yep, right, I grab. You know, I'd go around because mm. he didn't want to sort of talk to anyone else. So I'd go around, sit around, we'd laugh and joke and off I'd go. And this particular morning in 2010, I'd call him for a coffee. <clears throat> well, I didn't know he... I didn't know he had didn't know that I was got nominated to mm. be in the, mm. in the National Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Mm. And when I get there, Brett White, who worked for him, went, Graham and I talked and said, got to go, mate. I'm off to the States tomorrow. I said, right. Didn't say another word. Mm. Brett walks in, Jim, congratulations. And he's going, what for? What, 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 what's happened, Jim? Brett said, didn't you hear, Graham? Jim's been inducted in the National Drag Racing Hall of Fame. His, his hands went like this. He went white with rage. Shaking. Turned and walked away. We're not in the habit of editing 
uh, the conversations, but I have opted not to open this wound again by recounting in detail at least the breakdown of their friendship. I'm grateful that Jim has opened up on the subject, but for two reasons, I reckon we'll park it here. Firstly, Jim shares his version of what went on in his book, The Jim Reed Story, The Good, Bad and Ugly. I'll leave it for you to read. And if you feel compelled to go deeper on this subject, you can find it there. It's heavy and I want to respectfully keep a neutral position. That's fair, right? Jim, as you can tell, is fiercely loyal and felt hurt by what was alleged. Graham's not here to share his side and I'm very conscious of that. They are two fiercely competitive sportsmen who are both now in the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Hopefully one day they'll be able to have a conversation again. At least they are both eyes forward as the sport embarks on a new, more unified chapter with big potential for events and for the coverage to return to the glory days. Now let's get back to the podcast. Let's talk about a couple of things in relation to Sydney Dragway, building it, the the mission to do it. The um, I mean, Castle Ray had been gone for about eight odd years, I think, hadn't it? You, oh, longer, you, longer, twenty years. Sorry, sorry, yes, because then, then we then we then we used um, the main straight at Eastern Creek, didn't we? Mm. But but the notion of of building a an American style, um, you know, mm. proper venue that would be great for the sport, and that was a massive undertaking oh, yeah. wasn't it how uh, lobbying government and getting support from people like alan jones who was a very significant media figure in this in this city um, what would you believe hmm? a bike racer's wife was a brilliant journalist mm-hmm. and she she said to me jim i'm going to write alan jones a letter and at the bottom of the letter she put if you have any sympathy for us, you'll ring Jim Reed. Next thing you know, remember Daryl Braithwaite? The yes, singer? the singer. His wife. Yeah. His wife uh, Mickey Braithwaite. Mm-hmm. Mickey died of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Poor bugger. Alan worshipped the ground she walked on. Okay. Mickey was just the nicest person you would ever... Mm. She was just something again. She'd bring with Jim, Jim. Alan wants you to do this, or Alan wants you to do that, you know, we'd chat away. She was the loveliest lady. Mm. Alan had shattered Alan when she died. Mm. Had a row of lights on the wall. We'd be sitting in Alan's place having a chat. It's when he lived at um, Newdown. Yeah. And you'd look up, and for argument's sake, a blue light might come on. Alan would know who it was. <laughs> the lights represented right up to the Prime Minister. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. The importance of the caller. Yeah. <laughs> and Mickey would press the button and Alan would decide whether... <laughs> Take it or not. Or not yeah. <laughs> but um, Alan, this, this woman wrote, wrote this letter and it was outstanding. And, and that's how we got into Alan. Mm. It's just... There are, there are stories made of... of um you know, rallying, um, you know, masses of people in the drag racing community to to um, events that Alan uh, came to yeah. to show their support for yeah. this and so on, didn't yeah. they? We had used to have him painted on the front wall. As soon as I left, they took it off. It would have been there for life. Mm. Alan's name's on the plaque. <laughs> and that's another funny story, the plaque. Bob Carr were coming. Morris Yammer was the one who made it all happen, so we get this plaque made by Stan Sainty. Next movie we get a call, Alan's, <laughs> Alan's invited Bob and told him he should be there. <laughs> so we had to whip it back to Stan and turn it over the other side and put Bob Carr. <laughs> and and the, they've made a, a decision that they're going to hang it with the Morris Yammer side now. Are they? <laughs> yeah. Are they? Yeah. But I mean, it's a, a huge deal, mate, to... Um, and it took years, didn't it? Just walk us through a bit of that and how... How it came Six together. Years. Six years. We well, yeah. see, we had an election. Yep. Then we had the Olympic Games and then another election. Yep. All right, and every time we'd get on down the road... So we're talking around the, t- the, the, the toward the end of 2000 and the early part of the new yeah. century, aren't we? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I costed it and I figured I could build it with acceptable 
toilet blocks and everything like that for $27 million. Mm-hmm. What you've got to understand when the government builds something, it costs three times because two people have got to get a drink and, mm, and someone's mm. got to get paid to do it. Anyway, the head of the Olympic Coordination Authority said, Jim, that's a, a $57 million project. I said, where do you get off saying that? Well, that's what it would cost if we built it. I'm not asking you to build it. Mm, we'll do it. Mm. And I said, I'll do it. And they said, you can't because you're a private gym. And there's five, five million people around this city who would all like the same opportunity for the government to give them a handout. It's got to be done by... A tender a, process and a, and a... yeah. All yeah. of the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Well, in the end, it was... Uh, Bob come up with 27 million. Now, one of the things we didn't know, Bob could spend 20 million. Any premier at any given minute can mm-hmm. spend 20 million once a year. Mm-hmm. Not have to go to cabinet. Hit the go button. Just do yeah. it. Yeah. So Bob spent 27, <clears throat> but didn't tell us that 7 million of the money, no, 20, yeah, 27, 7 million of the money was to move the highway. Oh, right. So that's seven million that did, didn't come to you, to us. So then Hollands get the job, and Hollands told Bob that they would build the car parks. Well, the, the last minute they pulled out of building the car parks because they didn't get the job digging the big hole over at the tip. They were going to bring all the dirt over and put it in there. Mm. And so we were further behind the eight ball. And all of a sudden, all of this shoddy work's going on and the toilet blocks were built. Um, they should have been condemned by the health department because, well, they were built flat in the ground. They were supposed to have a 300 air gap underneath yeah. them. And they didn't. And then to put the 300 air gap, they had to put ramps in for the handicaps so they didn't want to pay for the ramps. So they just plonked them all straight in the ground. Half the, half the problem with it was when it the plumbing underneath them, because they were built for building sites. Mm. And there's still some there. All the floors fell out. And, um, and Bob come along to us and, and said, now, is there anything you can do to lighten the load? I said, what do you mean? Well, is there any project you guys can come up with where we can get some money back, because we've got to get money back in the coffins? Well, it didn't dawn on me till Morris Emma smarted me up. Bob had pulled 20 million mm. out without telling the cabinet, <laughs> right? And the other seven million was allocated to Blacktown Council. Okay. So Bob's ass was covered. Yeah. And he told us I'm giving you twenty seven million. He didn't. And it was shoddy. It was just the the wing walls, the drainage was never done right behind them. The main building leaked water constantly. The elevator would stop halfway up and down. We could never get it fixed until the old man upstairs must have been looking down one day, but the prick who was supposed to fix the elevator in, in yep. public works, kept saying no. Happened to get jammed halfway between floors in the elevator. While he's in it, while he's in it. <laughs> then they fixed him. <laughs> so it was just, um, it was a comedy of errors. I'd go out there of a day, every day, I'd go out mm-hmm. there because if you didn't, they'd say, oh, well, you weren't here if something went wrong. And they're boring up and down, up and down and Every time you'd make a suggestion, they'd threaten to stop, and it was just... They poured the concrete wrong, put gaps in it, then they had to grind it. Then they had some guy with a five-metre-long piece of timber going along trying a cigarette paper underneath it. And mm. It was hills and hollers everywhere. It was, the, the workmanship was as shoddy as you'd ever believe. And don't worry... It'll get fixed. So he comes up to us and says, can you come up with a game plan or a business plan where we can get some money back? Money back, yeah. Well, between the freeway and Eastern Creek, that used to be wide open spaces mm-hmm. all up there. And I said, well, all that land over there, you could develop it into industrial. Hmm. Where Arnott's is now, where all those buildings no, are no, now. Well, or we're on... Oh, the far side. Sorry, the, the other side. I beg your pardon. The okay. freeway, right? Yep, yep. Yep. You know where the big hotel is? On, there's the roundabout. The yes. big hotel is on the corner. Yep. When you turn the roundabout... On the other side that, of that. That turn four, mm-hmm. it's called, right? Yep. Well, that was our idea. Okay. So they just started demolishing Wonderland 
And Bob calls me up, or his representative calls me up and says, Bob needs to get some money back quick. You can have it all for 22 million. So I ring up all the guys I knew with plenty of money that all just bought Wonderland and all of that stuff mm -hmm. before that big intersection was made. They said, Jim, we can't help you. So I said, what do I do? So I went back, I said, look, no. What we'll do, we'll get an auction. So we get 38 million for it. Oh. Right? <laughs> Not, not would he give us back one dime, just be grateful. Not would he give us a dime to spend fixing things. We had no pit areas, no this, no that. I borrowed $2 million to build a, a pit area in the pits. Then we spent $11 million all up of our own money. The big cafeteria that's there, we built that. I did a deal for all the other buildings to be built for a charge. Um, Mulgoa quarries were digging all the tunnels not digging them, but carting the dirt away. Mm. So it was all certified dirt. So we made a quarter of a million dollars there by taking the certified mm. dirt for mm. the filling. And it's, they stuck the speedway in the middle of it. We lost that much. If you went out there and looked, you'd shake your head. Mm. The place was a shithole mm. when we moved in. Mm. We had tractors pulling people out of bogs and in the car parks. It was just disgraceful to happen at the first event. But that's how it went, and we consequently just kept moving on because I was worn out, six years fight to get the place, and thought, oh, well, we're here, we'll get it up, get it going. But how does the, Let's just come back one step for a second. How does the 14-year-old who didn't finish school, who admittedly has gone on and run his own businesses successfully and dealt with big corporations that are sponsors and so on, how does that bloke go with politics, with lobbying with un, I mean, cuz you're a you are just a straight talker mate yeah. a handshake is a handshake and that's basically the end of it isn't well, it I'll tell you what happened you remember I can't remember her name hmm. but the member for Parramatta was the minister for sport and mm -hmm. he died mm -hmm. and he left this gorgeous looking wife who got voted back in as his seat mm -hmm. so they made her the sports minister mm -hmm. but First off, they came to me and said, we want you to run for the seat of Parramatta. Holy! Well, I lived in Maryland. Yeah. Did you give that some serious thought? Would you, would you have done well, that? Well, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> so Winfield says to me, we'll back you all the way. So I go to a meeting and I sit down with them. They said, you're a shoe and you'll get it, hmm. you'll win it. I said, right, and well, tell me what I've got to do. They said, nothing. So what do you mean, nothing? No, they said, we'll give you a minder. He'll tell you what you've got to do. I said, what? Someone's going to tell me what to do. You want me to be the sports minister, but this other guy's going to tell me. He's, he's really the sports minister in disguise. Yeah, no, shove it up your ass. <laughs> I wouldn't take it. Hmm. I said, no, no, no. I, I'm not going to be told what to do. I'll mm. do what I believe is right. Right. Yeah. And, and, oh, and then she got the job. The Aussie have a go attitude is something that filters through Rusty's chats. Like Jim Reed, Bruce Garland was all in when it came to taking on the world's toughest race, Dakar. The budget that was getting was tight just went way out the window, like it was a hundred thousands of dollars. So we had to reassess everything. And anyway, we, we, we had to cut back our spare. We had to do a real shuffle to get the numbers to work. And then when we sent it, we didn't have any money to pay for it to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we just said, hey, we're going to do all right. Hang the expense. We'll find a way. Rusty tends to blow the podcast budget on hair and makeup. Has anyone told him it's an audio experience? Back to Jim Reed now. So it, it took you just an exhausting six plus years to to get there. Yep. What you end up with is not what you dreamed of, but the essence of it, Jim, is you know we were grateful. Yes, yeah. but we shouldn't have been. Hmm. You know, we were we were we were blind to what was happening to us really because everybody else was getting their facilities built. Look at the look at the football grounds they were getting built now. Mm. And <clears throat> last year 
not last year, 2018, mm. Alan organised a meeting with Stuart Ayres. Mm-hmm. So we go see Stuart. I said, Stuart, the Labor Party built us a pile of shit. Mm-hmm. We've got to fix it. Mm. Nobody seems to want to talk to us. Alan, that's why we're here. I said, we need $33 million to fix the place. Mm. I said, we need $11 million a year for three years. Mm-hmm. I don't want any more money given to us all at once, just mm-hmm. $11 million. Yep. We'll see out that $11 million, we'll come and get the rest. I want the money audited by two totally independent people. Mm-hmm. The quotes and the payouts and everything. I mm-hmm. don't want nothing to do with handling the money. Mm-hmm. I don't want any drag racer having anything to do with handling the money. Mm-hmm. Right, he said. So, next thing you know, I'm doing a lot of deals with the Chief of Staff. Megan Senior was her name. Mm-hmm. And she rings me up. <clears throat> And she said, oh, we're getting ready to make the big announcement. But Jim Stewart's really stressed. Is there anything you can do to lighten the blow? I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, it's too much money all in one hit. I said, but I'm not asking for it all in one hit. Hmm. Oh, I said, well, read the proposal. It's 11 million a year. Hmm. Staggered. For three years. Hmm. Oh, oh, she said. Oh, Stuart will be so happy. So, right, we get our 11 million. The balance of the 33 went to the mob over the road. <laughs> they got the other 22 million, right? So, this prick used us. So, then, so, all right, so we get 11 million, turns mm-hmm. up. No contracts, no confirmation letters, no nothing. 11 million turns up. So we start working away and working away and all of a sudden the rain hits, all that bad rain, yep. then COVID. Yep. yep. Well, we're two years in and we hadn't drawn any more money yet. So when we went to draw some more money, oh, no, no, there's no more money for you. The grant's finished. The, the, the... Said, no, woo, woo, there's the proposal. <laughs> oh, yeah, but... You didn't use it. They said, no, you know what they said? Oh, well, where's the letter of confirmation? I said, you're asking the wrong person here. Anyway, I got some legal advice and they said, no, if you've not received any letter stating this is how it's going to be hmm. or no, we don't accept for 33 million, here's 11, hmm. fine. But what they've sent you 11 million, yeah, as far as we're concerned, they've accepted your contract, your proposal, because they've sent you the first payment. Yep. Anyway, so then I get letters from telling them how how ungrateful I am and all the rest of that shit, but we're still fighting them for it. Last year, I wrote to every minister, never got any replies except one from Ayers. Mm. In the end, in October of last year, I wrote to the Premier. Now they've got a new system where you're screened when you write to them. It'll either go, don't want to talk to you in that bin. Don't want to talk to you in this bin. That's what happens now. My wife can tell you. So you're branded kind of thing, are you, mate? Oh, are yeah. You, are you? Yeah, there's a red light, reads, reads writing, reads writing. Anyway, um, so then I wrote to the sports minister, flatly denied anything. Mm. Didn't, didn't come back to us. Well, now... You know, I just spent three hours with the new sports minister. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Are you making progress? We will be meeting with him again pretty soon. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, Minns has got them all shitting themselves. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. They can't agree to anything whatsoever. <laughs> None of them. Or otherwise you're gone. But maybe he'll do the right thing. Maybe he doesn't want them running out causing, for argument's sake, if we get money, mm. people are going to know it. Mm. Oh, why are they getting money? Mm. So then it causes a ripple somewhere else. Yes. And, yeah. Hopefully, I'll get somewhere with a new guy. Mm. Uh, a guy who used to be the right-hand man to Morris is a good friend of mine. He's, mm-hmm. he's on um, extended leave from the Labor Party and government. Mm-hmm. 
and he writes, helps me. I write a letter, and then he fixes it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My wife normally fixes it after I write, and then he fixes it again. He, Bill, Bill gets stuck into mm. it and makes it come good. And it's um, we've got the the new letter ready to go. And what mm. it is is a history on the sport, mm. and it keeps emphasising the fact we're the only ones doing anything for the kids off the street. Mm. You know, we used to open on a Friday night, let all the kids in the gate mm. for ten dollars. Come in Friday night, can't mm. race. Mm. Ten dollars. Yeah, it's just because we've got to pay the security guards that are necessary, and that's yes. where the money goes. Yeah. And you just got to all come here. You can pretend you're beef burgers. Restaurant will be open. You just got to. Well, it was going fantastic until the fucking highway patrol started turning up, locking the gates and defecting everyone. So where do the kids go? Back out on the road Same racing. Hmm. You know, just it's it's painful hmm. to see what they do. I don't give a fuck if his nose is running. Hmm. Somebody get a tissue and wipe it and help him. Hmm. You know, it's. Half these kids come from a terrible life. Mm. Half from a, and you're giving them an escape, something to aspire well, to. To uh, it's not that. It's mm. and, you, and you're showing a bit of love to them. You mm. know what I'm getting at? Mm. Mm. Here's these kids growing up. They've probably come from a family and they've had eight stepfathers or four stepmothers or mm. you know what I'm getting at. Mm. And they haven't got a hope in life unless mm. somebody reaches out to them. Mm. And gives them, hmm. and we're trying to convince the government that these kids, these kids, didn't ask to be born, hmm. you know. And sure, some of them you'll never fix. Hmm. But Jesus Christ, if you get out there and you you hold your hand out to them and you're showing a bit of love to them, hmm. we'll get to some more racing to to finish this. But let's let's finish the the Sydney Dragway chapter, knowing all that you've put into it, knowing the incredible lobbying work you've had to do, um, the, the work to try and get it to, um, you know, the level of pride that you wanted mm. for it. How do you feel about it now, all these years later? Where are you, where are you at with it? Well, we're getting there. Good. Um, I was asked to go back on the board. I refused. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I've had some illnesses and I, I can do more outside. But... Um, <clears throat> I think with some of the big announcements that you've referred to before that mm -hmm. are coming today is going to help immensely. Mm -hmm. But there's still still a fair bit of work to happen in fixing the place, mm -hmm. making it more user-friendly, and let these... let Like we went through before with the kids, mm. it needs... Those kids have the confidence that we're not going to persecute them mm. when they come there. And you're not going to get that unless you initiate it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see happen now. Bring these kids in. Like Bathurst. Bathurst is an outstanding race. I can remember mm. when you could fire a gun up there. Yep. And they build it and build it and build it, mm. right? Now, you take all of those guys off the hill that go up on the hill. Mm. They turn up. It's tradition. Mm. Can you imagine if the cops go up there and start raiding them and going mm. on what's going to happen? Mm. You're going to lose those guys off mm. the hill. Mm. Well, why should you? They're enclosed. What are they doing wrong? Mm. If they go out in the road, that's not our business. Mm. Start being clowns. Mm. And that's what's going to happen out here. Mm. You know, if you try to go and do anything over the road, they charge a fortune. We don't want to charge these kids anything. Mm. I think it should be government subsidised, but it probably won't. Mm. But we'll subsidise it if they give us the opportunity mm. and let us fix the place. Mm. Kids need more opportunity. That'll finish the place. Them kids are going to grow up to be drag racers. Mm. You know, that's what you want. You want to fence them in. You want to keep them, keep them, keep them with you as a yeah, part of that. Well, mm. you know, you, you want to be able to tell them your story, mm. mate. I had the ass out of my pants when I was nineteen. Mm. I had a wife and a son, and a beat up FJ holding you. Mm. I didn't lie down and cry. Mm. I didn't go to anyone and say, Jesus, you know, you've got a better car than me. Mm. Poor me. Mm. Mm. You know, you said, you've, got to have a, have a, you've got to have a goal in life mm. that, you, that you want to work to. And it's, um, it's not hard. Mm. It's a matter of instilling the confidence in these young fellas yeah. that come out there to race and, and stop and if, like, you've got no idea the number of people walk by our pit area. Mm. And whether I know them or not, I'll, 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 stop if they want to talk, to I'll stop and talk mm. to them. Mm. You've noticed that I yeah. talk too much. No, it's good. That's good. And and it's they deserve the same opportunity sure. I've got. Yeah. And, and you're not going to get it by running away from them. No. And that's what the government's doing with the motor. Look, could you imagine if they spent $350 million on them 
that whole area. Like mm. I, I said on one time, this should have a dual lane road come around the back instead of where the big island is at yep. their front gate, turn left, go up, and then a, a big road goes around, comes down, dumps out for the dragway, dumps out for the circuit. The, the circuit. Yeah. And no, no, the gate through traffic's not affected. Hmm. That's what they were going to do once, not anymore. Oh, no, we'll build another $550 million, or we'll knock down the $350 million stadium. We, we want our $22 million. What we were going to do with that $22 is now $30 million. Hmm. I'm not going to ask them for $30 million. Hmm. We'll make do. We'll get it done. Hmm. But we need people to come there and go away and tell other people, God, it's a great place, place to go. Place to go, to. exactly. You know? yeah. But in the Speedway guys are poor bastards. I feel so sorry for them. Hmm. They deserve better. Hmm. You know, they have one problem. They have no one to get off their arse. Hmm. You know, I know Max and all of them. Yes. Yeah. I'd ring them up. Listen, this is what you got to do. Oh, yeah, but mm. they don't want to do it. Mm. Speedway was supposed to be independent. Same as, same as. Mm. It's not. Mm. It's nothing like it. Mm. The poor bastards sitting in the grandstand because they went... <laughs> Did you ever go to Grandville? Oh, no, all the time. Right? All the time. Well, there was the trot and track, mm. the, the circuit yep. trot and track, and then the grandstand, right? Mm. Out here, but minus the trotting track, mm. people were so close. Yeah, they need mud guards. Yeah, you're getting, getting. Yeah, it's yeah. not like for like. Mm. Motorsport, to me, is V8 supercars is very, very lucky mm. that Cochran came along, mm -hmm. and he left them in good shape. Mm. He knew when to bail out. Mm. I'm hoping the Mustang and the yep, Camaro, mm -hmm. but the Camaro isn't built anymore. Mm. You're aware of that. Mm. Hmm. They don't build it hmm. in America. Yep. But somebody's building fiberglass shells. Yep. <laughs> we all deserve what we yep. can get. And I'd love to get 500000 a year, like a footballer does, even if he's second rate, hmm. to be able to go out and continue in my sport. Yep. But I can't. Hmm. Never, ever will. But at least I can go out with my family and enjoy it. And if it costs some money to do it, fine. Yeah. But the opportunity's got to be there for others. Yeah, one at, at, at one a, drag strip in New South Wales. Hmm. One. Hmm. We've got four magnificent stadiums in Sydney. Hmm. Hmm. What do we do? Hmm. I don't know. I, I, I draw on the line after I get the 22 million that's owed to the place. Yeah. That's, that's it for you? Uh, will that be it for you, will it, in terms of... No, right, only at the track. I'll yeah. still keep my eye on it. Mm-hmm which I do, I just keep my eye on it. Mm. You feel good when the people that can't come up and ask you mm. about things, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And I don't mind sitting down talking to anyone if they're genuine mm. about what I think's right and what I think's wrong. Like out there the other day, you've got this section in the middle where it's filling up with too many people. Mm. And I said, one of these days, somebody's going to blow a backfire and wipe someone's head off. And then... Work cover will get in here, mm. and then we're fucking no one. Yeah, correct. I mm. said it'll shut the place. Mm. But that's another approach. We've got to try and keep the people safe. Mm. Mm. They all congregate down the middle. Yep, it's so unsafe. Mm. Let's let's do a couple of things to finish. When I walk through the workshop before, which is amazing, there's some cool cars in there, and there's a special one of yours hanging up on the on the wall. I want you to tell people about the car from your time as a driver, the one that you have maybe a special attachment to, a fondness for, and the result, the race, the, you know, achievement. What, which... The red car. Yeah. The Winfield car, yes. Is that the one that I saw up on the on the yep. wall? Yeah. Yeah, that was... That was a great car. We, we won a lot of races with that. Um, probably the most magnificent achievement out of th – there's a lot of races that were great to win, mm. but I think I, I used to have a bad – not a bad habit. I used to have a habit of winning last races. <laughs> I've never been to a race where it's going to – like Castle Ray, I won the last ever race, mm. right? So then it – going back many years – 
Willowbank Raceway got itself into trouble mm-hmm. financially. Mm-hmm. So I rang up Uncle Lee and I said, mate, we've got a problem. Mm-hmm. He said, good, which Brisbane. So we jump in the plane, we fly up there. Somebody dudded him, mm-hmm. right? We knew it was. Mm-hmm. They were building a tower. So Uncle Ian comes in, he looks around and he says, the tower, you got no money to finish it? He said, no, he said, well, we'll pay for that. And it's, you paint it red and white? Mm. Yep. Winfield, mm. Everick, everywhere, yep. And they were loyal to Uncle Ian. Mm. Even after tobacco finished, mm. it's still today part of it, still red and white. Wow, wow. Um, because he dug them out of a big hole. Mm-hmm. But the last ever drag race mm-hmm. for tobacco was held at Willowbank. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of the date. Prohibition came in, I believe it was on the 30th of December mm-hmm. in 1995, mm-hmm. or the 31st. That sounds about right. Mm-hmm. And we went out, and the place was crammed. We give away a red and white little car. Mm. Uh, We had thousands upon thousands of Winfield hats, Mm. last race made, which I've still got some. And um, we subsidised the shit out of it, put up the prize money. You couldn't move in the place, and we won the last race. Unreal. It was incredible. Mm. The crowd came over the wall. You know, they just, mm. we're coming, towing back up the racetrack, mm. and the crowd just mm. over the wall and just stood there. Mm. It was just uh, an incredible good feeling for mm. me and Ian mm. that I won the last race. How did it feel that, that you know, uh, that's, that, that long-term sponsorship, that great partnership was coming to an end. Winfield was family. Mm. Was Winfield it must have been difficult? One big family, mm. I'll tell you. Mm. Um, it was devastating, mm. I'll tell you. I remember I waking up the next day, well, yeah, well, when we got back from Queensland and looking at the race car, and at the time I said, I'll never, ever, ever change that car, I'll just leave it as it is. But as it turned out, mm. I, they said to me, no, look, get all the signs off it, mm. take them all off and go race it. Mm. But they weren't even allowed to give me money, even if I didn't have signs. If I had no uniforms, no nothing, mm. they weren't allowed to give me money. money. Mm. And um, <clears throat> that's why I swore it always stay red. But that was an incredible feeling, winning that race. It was just like top qualifying at Pomona. Pomona. Mm. And when I won the, <coughs> the three titles in a row in Adelaide for three years and almost three titles with the other car as well mm. at the same time, <coughs> it was just an incredible feeling. Mm. And it was funny, we, we all went back to the hotel for dinner because it was a daytime race. And we got into the grog, see. <laughs> anyway, the, you know, you do the... You let yep. let out the steam. It's done, yeah. Anyway, the waiter comes up and I said, another round of drinks. The waiter says, who for? I said, everybody. I said, what do you mean, everybody? I said, what do you mean, what do I mean, Everybody. Everyone in the room, buy him a drink. <laughs> so on the Tuesday after we get back to Sydney, I come in and he says, Bill. <laughs> Jim, what happened? How big was it? Six and a half thousand. Oh, fair. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and did Uncle Liam look thing. after it? Did he look after it? Oh, he says, uh, I'll try and figure this out. <laughs> he fixed it, but anyway. But was it hard to stop racing for you? How difficult was no, that decision? No. It wasn't? When Louis was killed, mm. I used to think, how could I ever put my son in a car? I could, didn't want to do it. Anyway, but now they're, now they're immersed in it, mate. They're, 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 you know, it's... Well, 
I probably should have stopped five years before I did. Mm-hmm. And I'd get in the car and wouldn't want to race. Really? But I'd still drive. I'd still, yeah, because mm. I didn't want Philip getting in the car. Anyway. So you were, you were literally pushing that back by staying in the, behind the wheel longer. Yeah. Really? Yep. Shouldn't have done it because I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to race then. But it gave you such a buzz as, as a young man. What, what? Yeah, there were still times where it did, but no, I'd, I'd had... See, I'd won over 275 events from hmm. 1966 through to the Rothman era. Yeah. You know, I had this fear hmm. after seeing Louis hmm. get killed. It knocked me around real bad. And um, so in the end, I said to... Bruce and Phil, I said, Phil, do you want to drive this car? He said, yes. Yeah. So go to Frank Hawley's. I'm not teaching you. <laughs> go to Frank Hawley's in America. If he tells me you can drive, then come back here and you can drive. Okay. Well, he went to Frank Hawley's and got flying colours. <laughs> and I always knew he would, mm. but I didn't want to have to make that decision. Mm. Be one out, one removed from yeah, it, kind I of. I wanted... Mm. Frank Hawley is considered the best. Mm. And he was a good racer himself. Mm. And I... And he ran a driving school. Mm-hmm. Now that other car that's in the shed is the car that type of car that Philip was taught on by Frank Hawley, mm-hmm. and he passed everything with flying colours. Is that Black Mamba? Was is that the one we're talking about? Which no, one? No. no, the other. The there's two cars on the floor. On the floor, sorry. Yeah, one's yep. an alcohol car. Mm-hmm. That's what Frank teaches everyone to drive on alcohol cars because mm-hmm. they've got to change. They've got to be busy. Yep. And he said, "Mate, he's ready for it." So. That's what happened. We put him in the car and hmm. he won three championships. But when it became real and you weren't doing it anymore, were you okay with that? Yes. When, yeah? Yes, I was. I was perfectly okay. I was calm as could be. Um, I just had every ounce of faith in him. I knew he could do it. Hmm. And you've never, you've never had a run somewhere again? Does the buzz... I no, mean, you, no, I know you chalked I've up... I've never sat in a fuel car. Really? Never since. Yeah. Have no desires whatsoever... But you don't miss the racing, as in, uh, as in you love spectating it. You don't, you won't miss an event, is what I'm trying to say. You know, no, you, you, I won't miss mm. an event. When, when, whenever my car runs, mm. I'll be there, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm enjoying it just as much. Yeah. I work here nearly every day Dying. doing something that yeah. shortcuts a few things for everyone else. Mm. You know, like today the crankshaft guy turned up. I organised all of that. And mm. If something's got to be welded, I run it away. Mm. I grind all the floater plates and clutch plates and everything. Do you, under, do, you, do you enjoy all I the... I enjoy the, it all, yeah. I just enjoy it all. And the boys, we've got a fabulous group of guys. Mm. Yeah. Bruce spoils them. Does he? Yeah. <laughs> In what way? In what way? Oh, he just spoils <laughs> them. He appreciates them. And mm. when they come to work, they all have dinner at Bruce's. And Lovely. last night, two of them stayed here because they live too far away to get mm. to work in the mo- morning. this morning. Yeah. So, you know, they stayed here at Bruce's house. And mm. but it's... Um, he, Bruce is very calm. Mm. I've spoken with him on the phone for this, yeah. so I know. Yeah, very calm, mm. and he. Let me tell you, mm. he would have made a hell of a politician. Would he? Oh yeah. 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 He probably would have got run off a bit through being too straight up and down, but he, he made a. He, he was a good pol- politician. He would have made a good politician. politician. Mm. He's very very. Um, He comes over pretty strong, mm-hmm. but deep down he's very soft-hearted. Is he? And he is with the crew mm. as well. Treats mm. them like they're his own, mm. which is good. Mm. I just amble on. I don't tell him what to do. Mm. I don't know. What do I know? You know lots. And I, I think that, that your yeah. love for it is still immense, which is, which oh, is yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, I am grateful, mate, that we've been able to finally sit down and do this chat. So thank you. Well done on all the statistics. You're going to have to. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll happily you're sit have down to and. The rubbish well, that's fine. That's fine. There's not. There's not a. You know. There's. That's a joyful job to be able to sit and and you know um, help tell your story, and the fact that you've been internationally in the Hall of Fame, domestically in the Australian Motorsport Hall of Fame. That should have happened year one, but that's another story. Um, and I know you're very proud of the Advanced Australia thing too, mate. Which you, which you should be. 
thank you for betting so hard for drag racing, mate, and for, for the well, You know, we got an award off the Queen quite a few years ago. Tell me about that. It's hanging on the wall of my office. It's one of those sports awards, John Howard time. And, yep. Um, we were the first drag racer mm. to ever get a photograph of the car and, it, and myself in, in the Guinness Book of Records. Tell me about that to finish. Well, it's hanging on the wall in there. So James Hardy and I were the first ever Advanced Australia ambassadors. Congratulations. And, um, you know, we're everywhere I, I used to go to the races in America with the biggest bag of Australian badges mm. and people would queue up for an Aussie badge. badge. You know, but yeah. I've still got a couple of them somewhere, but it's um, still got some of the Advanced Australia stickers. Mm. But then all of a sudden it just stopped. Mm. We'd go to meetings in the city and Sir James would say, it's a good restaurant up the road, you come on, we'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, I forget his name. Um, he was a radio announcer here, big fella, hmm. with wore glasses, deep voice. And in 1982, he flew in in a helicopter mm-hmm. in the Castle Row yeah. on a Tuesday, I think it was, and gave me this... Uh, uh, this award, this Advanced Australia Award, hmm. and the badges and everything. And I was in a, somewhere. I got a badge. I'm an Advanced Australia ambassador and all of that. I carried, I carried the Olympic flame, not the flame. The, yeah, what, I know the torch, the, the torch, the torch, the yeah. torch when it did its tour. Yeah, hmm. when this was down at um, where the Olympics was held. Yeah, down at Homebush. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, there's photos of up there. I've got the gloves, the white gloves, hmm. you know, and you wore the white suit and all of that shit. Hmm. The Westpac Bank, I was their guest in that. That's excellent. They all, yeah, yeah, it was good, but the the uh, medal from the Queen was good. Um, oh shit, you know, stuff hangs on the wall. I sound like a smart ass. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. What do you reckon? This is my final question. You're going to be 80 in January, if I've got my math right. Mm. So what are we talking there? Six, seven months away. What do you reckon 80-year-old Jim Reed would say to the 14-year-old kid who was nearly put in a home kind of thing? Or what do you reckon you'd tell him now about, about life and what to do? Well, I'd just tell him about my life. Mm. And I'd just tell him. Have a go. Mm. If someone calls you a failure... You're not a failure if you don't have a go. If you have a go and you don't succeed, get up off the ground and have another go. But if you have a go, you're not a failure. I I never let anyone call you a failure because everyone can't succeed. Hmm. But Jesus Christ, you you might learn a bit or go off down another avenue Hmm. in life Hmm. that suits you. Hmm. It might be the same as I did, but you might go down this way, you could end up a rocket scientist for all mm. I know, mm. but you've got to try. Mm. Only you can do it. No one can do it for you. Mm. I can tell you what I did, you know, and I only told you half the story. I know, I, know. I, did, you know. I know. Thank you very, very much. It's been a joy to sit here and talk with you. The book is something people should go and you. read. I'm no, you have never book. haven't bored me one bit. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series editor and producer is Thomas Dullard. Audio production by Link Kelly. If you've got a guest suggestion, get in touch with me via social media. The Garage, that's where a journey begins with a tank full of passion-fuelled stories.